Savior, He can do the mountain. 
Psalm, the third chapter. Begin reading in verse 1, and we'll read through the end of the psalm, verse 8. Verse 1. O Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. So many are saying, God will never rescue me. And then there's an interlude. Verse 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain. And there's another interlude. Verse 5. I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I'm not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. Arise, O Lord, rescue me, my God. Slap all my enemies in the face, shatter the teeth of the wicked. Victory comes from you, O Lord. May you bless your people. And another interlude. Now, what I didn't read was the title of the third psalm. Why was this psalm written? What, what motivated David to talk about people being against him and, and the Lord being a shield around him and he being able to sleep at night and victory coming? The title gives us what was really taking place. This is a Psalm of David. It regards the time that David fled from his son Absalom. Absalom was his, his third child. But a lot of things have gone on. In fact, we have to go to the second Psalms, a second Samuel, the 12th chapter. Now, we're, these are just going to be bullet points. A lot of things that took place are not going to be mentioned. These are just things that, that highlight for us what's been happening in David's life concerning this particular Psalm. So, second Samuel, chapter 12, Nathan the prophet rebukes David's sin of adultery with Bathsheba and then his involvement in the murder of Uriah, which is Bathsheba's husband. 2 Samuel 13, Amnon. Amnon is Solomon's firstborn child from his first wife. Amnon has fallen in love with Tamar, which is Solomon's sister from one of David's wives. Later, as Amnon has raped his sister Tamar, it would be later that, that Absalom would get revenge on what Amnon had did and Absalom would kill him. 
2 Samuel chapters 14 and 15. It's been a while, but Absalom returns to Jerusalem with King David's okay. He then, through a period of time, conspires to take David's throne, and he is successful. David escapes Jerusalem as king, but with no throne, and a small army, and relatively little power, and yet he still has some, some key interests that are going to help him. 2 Samuel chapters 16, 17, and 18. Here we have Absalom's fall and his ultimate death. And we have David's victory and his return to Jerusalem to sit on the throne where he is king. So that's a really quick look at why this particular psalm was written by David. So David's had a lot of things happening. But in this particular case, this has to do with his, his time away from Jerusalem, while his son Absalom is sitting on the throne. So let me go over a few things real quickly that, that help us as we go through the, the, the verses that are here. Everything is falling apart in verses 1 and 2. Lord, I have so many enemies and so many are against me. His son Absalom... There are military leaders that follow Absalom. There are spiritual leaders that follow Absalom. The people that Absalom has coerced to say that David really isn't meeting their needs, but if he were king, he would take care of them. The people are beginning to follow him. As David is leaving Jerusalem and he's climbed up through the Kidron Valley, up to where the Mount of Olives is. He makes his way across the Mount of Olives and on his journey out of Israel across the Jordan River where he can find safety from Absalom and the army. Verses 3 through 6. But you, Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. There are three things that David knows about his relationship with God. Number one, God is his shield. And not just the shield to protect him from the front, but his shield over his entire life. He's going through a very, very difficult time. He's no longer seen as king of Israel. But, God, but, but David remembers who God is. David knows that God has still chosen him and is still working on his side as he is working on God's side. So, when I say that remember God is, it's important for us to realize that David understands who God is and he then outlines this for us in verses, in verses 3 through 6. Remember, God is your shield, your protection. Doesn't mean that you're not going to go through hard times like David did. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have people who don't like you like David did. Not going to mean that people are going to throw stones at you. Perhaps words like David. But God showed his love for David by protecting him. As David knew that God was his shield didn't keep him from going through the problems, didn't keep him going through the crisis and the conflicts. But it did mean that David could trust in God. And if this is what God wanted for his life, David was willing to accept it and trust that God knew what he was doing as he would stay confirmed and dedicated and committed to his Lord. Remember, God is your shield as he was David's shield. Remember that God is your glory. You know, we just don't often take that word and use it for ourselves. 
but God is your glory as God was David's glory. God is your glory. What does that mean? In its simplest of terms, it means that God's presence is with you. God's presence was with David. God's presence was with David as he led his people, led his family, led his small army out of Jerusalem, escaping Absalom. With his back to the temple, to the, the, to the, the, uh, the, the tent of meeting, temple to be built later, with his back to the, the, um, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, his back to the, the gates of the city of Jerusalem where he had been king and leader and seen God's favor on his life. With all of that in his rearview mirror, he's walking, perhaps ashamed, head tilted down. It says that he left with his with with no sandals on no no footwear he walked barefoot he walked with his head covered he walked ashamed tired and not sure what his future was but what did david have in the midst of all of this this conflict and agony and defeat God never doubted, or David never doubted the presence of God. That's hard to see. That's hard to understand. That's hard to know why you're walking through all of this difficulty. All of the, 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 the people who really hate you or people who don't care about you, people who don't love you. You have people that maybe family members, maybe friends or even neighbors who look at you with a, a sense of consternation. Maybe they look at you with an attitude that's saying, yeah, yeah you think you're such a, a hot dog Christian. Where is your God now? I'm sure, that's how David felt. But he never forgot that God, God's presence was with him. Don't you ever forget when you're in the valley, and it's easy to. Don't you ever forget when you're up against thousands, and that's what David saw were thousands against him, but maybe your thousands are just a few people, but maybe your thousands are at work, maybe your thousands are, are a family, I don't know, but, but never forget that whoever it is that is causing issues and problems, and no matter what it is that you're going through, that God's presence, His glory is with you. Certainly, if there's sin, like had been in David's life, there must be confession and forgiveness. And there was in David's life. And he confessed of his sin before God, before Bathsheba, and before Uriah. And so, he knew, in spite of his failures, that God would still love him. Because Nathan the prophet told him his sins had been forgiven. That didn't mean that he wouldn't suffer problems and issues in his life for the days ahead. Remember, God is your glory. God is your presence. And remember that God is your lifter. I like this. I, I, can, I can imagine seeing it in some kind of movie where David and his, and his small band of brothers and sisters and family and, and army are walking away dejected. David's head bowed, wondering why it had all come to this. But somewhere along the way, somehow, as God was his presence, was God was, was in him lifting him, even though he was, he was escaping, in the midst of his escape, he beca God became David's lifter. You are my glory, he, David says in verse 3. You are my, the one who holds my head high. If you've lived for God, if you've followed Him, if you've done the best you know how to do, and, and all of that, and all of a sudden you find yourself on the end of a bad time. 
never forget that no matter what you're going through, you may not be able to lift your own head, but if the presence of God is in you and you continue to trust him and you continue to follow him, no matter what is happening, no matter how many dominoes are falling around your life, he will lift your head. And what will he do to lift your head? He'll lift your head up high. Because you are still a child of God. You are still one who follows him. You are still one who has God in the throne room of your own heart. Now, if you're not sitting on a throne, you know he's sitting on your throne in your heart. And... Being able to get through the days ahead will be difficult. And there'll be times of, of, of emotional responses where you wonder where God is at. And how are you going to get through this? And you, may, you may cry yourself to sleep at night. You may worry. You may do all kinds of things. But remember that if God is your shield and God is in you, in presence in you, in his presence in you, then he will be there to lift you up. You may not be able to see it now, but he will lift your head up higher. Why? Because God lives in you and God knows how all things will work out. In fact, it says in the scripture, all things work together for good to those who love him and follow the purposes of God. And you can't see it now. David couldn't see it. But his head was lifted. Another thing that I think David teaches us is that in verse 4, it says that I cried out to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. We might even be able to say that when you call, God answers. Well, not here because David didn't get back to the throne. You would have thought that God would have said to David, you turn your group around and go back in there and, and I'll, I'll take care of Absalom and the rest of the, the rest of the army. But in this case, David had to escape. Why? Maybe because he had learned to trust himself. It doesn't say in scriptures what it is, but maybe he had to learn to, maybe he learned to trust in his own instincts and perhaps those instincts weren't as good as they were in days before. Who knows why it all happened? We do know that God never left in fact, when David prayed, when David called, and the scriptures say he cried, when David cried out to God, and sometimes we need to go through certain circumstances that we may not know that we're going through, but we, we might need to go through some in order to remember that we need to cry out to God and not try to handle these things with our own wisdom and our own knowledge. And yes, he's given us that as we've grown older. But the fact is that ultimately God is the one who wants to save us and wants to help us and wants to give us guidance and direction and wisdom and knowledge. You call. God answers. And where does he answer from? He answers from his throne. Where is his throne? It wasn't the throne that David sat on. It was the throne of the Ark of the Covenant. It was the throne that symbolizes the place where God sits. It would be in the presence of God. And if you call, he will answer. Remember the spiritual dimension and the spiritual foundation of your life. It's always in God. It's always in Him. He has never and will never take His, take his presence away from where His rightful throne is. If you call Him and your heart is the throne room of God, you will find God always there. Never take God off the throne. You might, not, you might be able to out of your own personal life, but if you allow Him to stay on that throne in the midst of your most difficult conflicts, your most difficult times of your life, the more 
the heavier the burden, people against you, things just aren't working out. If you keep your eyes on Him, if you come to Him and cry out to Him, the one who lives in the throne room of your heart has the throne and has the presence to be able to help you in your time of need. In verse 5, it says, I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. At times, we really don't know why or what the, what's going to happen after the things that take place in our lives. It wasn't David's case. He didn't know what was going to happen after he escaped Jerusalem. But it says that when he went to sleep, he woke up in safety. In the midst of all this anxiousness, perhaps, and worriedness, when he went to bed at night, he knew God was on the throne room of his own heart. And he's expressing that here. When he went to sleep, he knew God would be still be in control because God never sleeps or slumbers. So when we are asleep, he sustains us and never lets go of us. Arise, O Lord, rescue me, my God. Slap my enemies in the face, shatter the teeth of the wicked. Victory comes from you, O Lord. May you bless your people. It's, it's how we pray for God to intervene. We don't know how God will. We don't know if God's going to slap somebody upside of the face or... Or if God's going to knock some teeth out. I haven't seen that happen. What I have seen is that when I leave, when David left all this into God's hands and trusted God to be able to move and do what he wants to do, God always comes through. May not be when we think he ought to, but he always comes through. Let me share with you three quick final thoughts. Number one, in the midst of feeling like you've lost it all, you will know your true relationship with God when no matter what is happening, you trust Him to carry you through your worst times. I know that's a long sentence. I'll read it again. I think it's important that you you get this. In the midst of feeling like you've lost it all, you will know your true relationship with God when no matter what is happening, you trust Him to carry you through your worst times. Next, God will give you peace over fear of people, fear of circumstances, fear of conflicts. God will give you peace over what you cannot control. But first, you have to acknowledge God on the throne of your own heart for Him to sit on that throne and give you this peace. And finally, God delivers the heart before He delivers you from your circumstances. God delivers the heart. If God is is supreme in your life, if He is the supreme ruler of your life, if He is king of your life, if He sits on the throne of your life, He will give you the heart, not of escaping, but He'll give you the heart of deliverance. And that heart will mean that that deliverance will only come through Him. Place your trust in Him. Remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will be done, but your will be done. That's where we find the peace of knowing that God is going to not only be with us, but to bring us through so that we might see Him work. We might see how much He loves us. And we might see His will done in our lives as well as in the lives of others that are involved 
with the contact, con, con, with the, the, the conflict and, and the, the difficulties and the problems. God delivers the heart before he delivers you from your circumstances. I ask that you would come to the place in your heart that David came when he was going through this big mess with Absalom. Come before him with a heart that is humble, a heart where there might need to be confession, might need to be repentance, but a heart that is humble before God and say, God, you sit on the throne of my life. You know how this is all going to work out. Not my will, but your will be done. I will trust you. Dear Lord, have your way. I know some people are going through some very hard times right now. The enemy would like to continue to burden us with, with issues and with failures and with problems, but you are king. You are redeemer. You are savior. You are our Lord, our friend. You love us. And we know that you still live in the throne of our own life. And if not, Lord, I pray that people right now who are listening will open up their heart and say, I, I made a mess of things in my own life and I'm, I can't make the right decisions. I can't work through all these issues that they will begin to pray and ask you to be king of their life. Ask you to sit on the throne of their own heart that their lives will be changed and they will find comfort in trusting you and for those of us who have followed you and sometimes Lord the the things the problems the, the issues of this life they they kind of get us down and we get discouraged would would you help us be reminded that that you still reign on our th on the throne of our heart and and you will guide us you will direct us we Lord, you will help us walk through the valley of the shadows of death for we will fear no evil and you will be there to help us get through the other side and in doing that, we will praise you in the worst of our moments. We will praise you as we see you working things out. And we will praise you when we see you victorious in our lives. May you be glorified and honored by how we live. In your name we pray. Amen.